Um, so I'm going to warn you, I love bugs and I love testing and I get really excited. So um, if I go too fast or talk too much with my hands and break the Zoom video, somebody just has to let me know. Um, I have the chat window open, but Noah, if you can let me know if there's questions that come in um, that I missed, that'd be cool. Okay, so the joy of finding books. I'm just gonna start. I think I'm gonna start. Yes, okay. Uh, so we're not gonna do this because we got some good feedback from folks in the Zoom chat window. I see a lot of developers um, and people maybe new to the field. Um, so that's, I like that. I like that. I think that's really interesting. So I'm a tester at heart, um, because that's what I love to do most, but I do a lot of other stuff too. Um, so my goals and expectations of this session, I will warn you, not warn you, I, I'll share. I had bad dreams about this session last night. I'm hoping today's in reality goes a lot, lot better. My goals for today's real life session is to have a very open environment. Uh, I guarantee it's gonna be an informal environment because I have no certificates, no formal training. This is just things I've picked up along the way that I am passionate about and want to share. <clears throat> uh, I wanna share my perspectives and thought process sit processes. I'm hoping to hear some or read some perspectives and thoughts back from you guys as well. That's one of the things I like most about Nerd Summit is just getting to talk to other people in other places. Um, one of the things I, another thing I like about Nerd Summit sessions is that even though if I'm in a session where a lot of stuff is going either right over my head or through my head, there's often some little thing that just sticks that I get curious about and I take back to my office. So I'm hoping maybe that will happen um, for some of you. So about me, I work for Carnegie Mellon University, which is based in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. I started off on campus in Pittsburgh and I've been remote for them working from Massachusetts for about five years now. <clears throat> my title is a software QA analyst. I think it's true for a lot of us that our title doesn't always define what we actually do. Um, the stuff I'm responsible for is this long list. It includes a lot of testing, a lot of different kinds of testing, but it also includes elaboration, test case writing, release management, production support, um, and a bunch of other stuff. Um, my contact info is at the very last slide. Um, so. I see that question in the chat and we'll get there in half hour, 40 minutes. <laughs> so why me, why this topic? Um, I wanted to try to contribute to Nerd Summit's community, um, but I wasn't sure what to talk about. Anyway, I wasn't sure. So I talked to my boss and she said one approach that she sometimes uses is to think about what do I love to do? What do I love to work on? And my immediate answer was, I love to test. And if truly, if I had a nickel for every time I said, I wish I could just test, um, I, I wouldn't be here. I'd be in some castle somewhere, I think. So we're here to talk about bugs. Let's talk about bugs. <clears throat> a frequently, occasionally wise person named me once said, <sighs> Regardless of how you test, whether it's manual testing, automated testing, regardless of what kind of testing, meaning it's functional, it's ADA, whatever, there's many kinds of testing, bugs are still bugs and finding them is better than not finding them. So I'm gonna rephrase that last part. <clears throat> regardless of how you test, regardless of what kind of testing, bugs are still bugs and me finding them is better than a user finding them. So we are nerds, we love math in theory. Um, so I tried math with bugs. So all bugs in the new code that we just finished writing minus the bugs that are found in QA equals fewer bugs released, fewer bugs, happier users, happier users, better than grumpy users. So it's like a win-win all the way around. Plus it's 
very, very fun. I didn't write this, <clears throat> as I said, but I, it's really, I find bugs because I care. Um, it just says it all. So, um, like I said, I know, so I've, I've a little more about me. Um, I've worked on the same team at the same organization for about 10 years. And that's all I know is our little world. So my language makes sense to me because that's what I know, but it might not make sense to everybody else. So for the next whatever minutes, a bug or a defect is anything that needs a change. <clears throat> there could be many reasons the change is needed, um, but it's just anything regard that needs a change regardless of kind of why, whether it's a requirements change, something that the BA missed, something that the developer missed, something that another developer's code accidentally broke, who knows why, but a bug is a bug. Um, <clears throat> QA is quality assurance, it's testing. My kind of loose definition is um, the goal of QA is to make sure it works and it doesn't error. Ideally, it works beautifully, it looks nice, the data is gorgeous, the logs are verbose and helpful, everything's, you know, just all wrapped up with a bow. UI is user interface. I did not know that when I very, very, very first started. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to use the word in test a lot, finding a bug in test. So in test for me means in test is where we do our QA, but I think other teams, their, their testing pre-release environment might be called dev, it might be called pre-prod, uh, there's probably other names that I don't know about, but that's what I mean when I say in test, is finding bugs in the code before it gets released to production. <clears throat> also, testing in my little world means all these different kinds of, I'm pointing at my monitor, <laughs> um, all these different kinds of testing. So there's manual testing, regression testing, we look at the data, we look at the logs. Um, our, all of our applications have uh, the concept of authorization. Again, our language, I don't know if that's everyone else's language. This is, um, we build specific, we build resources and qualifiers that control who, what kind, which user can do which action to which student at what time of every semester for every action. It's very uh, complex and we do a lot of testing to make sure that it keeps working correctly. Um, also performance, mobile friendly, testing in different browsers, text, testing different architectural work, um, and then ADA testing. Um, I'm not sure who else is in the same kind of boat as we are, but for, well, it's not for better or for worse. We are only very recently starting to really address um, efforts to become ADA compliant with our applications. Um, we should have done it years and years and years ago, but we're just starting the effort now. So along with that comes um, ADA testing. So. Anyway, I hope that gives some context to the words I'm about to keep sharing. <clears throat> Why do I love finding bugs? <clears throat> so I love finding bugs most when it's an edge case bug in test. <clears throat> so by edge case, I mean, I didn't open the app and, and find it right away. It took me quite a bit of time to dig and dig, set up different scenarios and find that that elusive, hard to find bug. Um, I like the edge case bugs that are in test because if it's an edge case, that means that elaboration and test case writing went pretty well, so we can feel good about that. Development pretty well, went pretty well because it was really hard for me to find. Um, I found it in test, which means I found it before a user has the opportunity to find it and we have an opportunity to learn, which is always good as long as we take the time to seize that opportunity. Why is finding 
bugs in tests good for everybody. A good bug means cleaner production code, which as we saw means happier users and they are better than grumpy users. A good bug, as <clears throat> I mentioned, also gives us a chance to improve our process. That could lead to better requirements, better elaboration, better test case writing, and ultimately it makes it easier for the devs to write their beautiful code that they can do so well. This is one of my favorite memes out there. Um, so we know that bugs are awesome and we know why it's good to find them in tests, but how do we, how can we do that? So tool number one uh, that I'm going to talk about, there's three tools I'm going to talk about. <clears throat> tool number one is a testing matrix. Um, the source of this, um, I, I think, so, a side note, um, I went to a QA conference in California called Star West <clears throat> a couple years ago, and they talked about a testing matrix. And um, it was kind of like, my husband's a therapist, it's kind of like therapy, where once you put a, a, a name to a thought, a label to a thought, it's easier to deal with. Learning about a testing matrix, I think it identified that we had kind of been doing that in our heads without knowing it but knowing that it's a thing that can be done officially and systematically and better gave us something to be excited about and pursue. Um, so testing matrix uh, just helps you figure, kind of flush out all the different scenarios that could be tested for a work item. I'm not gonna teach any of this. I'm not gonna teach a testing matrix. I'm introducing the concept there are tons of resources online if you want to learn more, and I do encourage you. I'll give examples of, of matrices, though. Oops. <clears throat> okay, so ignore the word another. I think I moved my slide order. Um, so an example of a testing matrix. So let's say we're building a new API service call that'll have inputs of name, amount, number, and status. And if they all match, then the status gets updated if the new status is considered a valid change per the code or whatever. So this, this is a real life example that came across my desk the past week. <clears throat> um, the initial test scenarios that were written, uh, there were five of them, the happy path, and then um, also the, the, I'm not gonna read them all, but there was five test scenarios, looked pretty good. So I was looking at it, uh, reading it, and it occurred to me that there was another test scenario that wasn't on the list, which made me then think about a testing matrix. So I did one. Once I kind of really laid it all out with the variables across the top and thinking about all the different combinations, it uncovered five more scenarios. Um, so I think spending the 15 minutes to put that together for, for me and my team, that was uh, very much worth the value of that 15 minutes of time. So that's one example of a test matrix. This is another one. This is also from, all this stuff is from real life. Um, so this is a few months ago, a developer made a change <clears throat> um, that affected different students at different campuses, basically. So again, I work at CMU. We have a few campuses across the globe. One is in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. One is in Doha, Qatar. So when they made the change, I thought, well, okay, they made that change, so I need to test it on Pittsburgh and Doha. And I thought that was it. And then once I like just stopped for a minute and took the time, I realized, oh, I also need to test it when the campus is unknown. And then my, my, my brain just went down the matrix path and I eventually wrote it all down. And it turns out there weren't two scenarios to test, there were 13 scenarios to test. So that again, I'm, I'm sure they were all fine, but it's good to know all the different scenarios to test so that we just make sure we don't let anything kind of fall through the cracks. So once you have this beautiful matrix, what, and I'm done testing, what, is there anything else I can do with it? 
So um, one thing I do with it is add it to our documentation. Um, so one of the bullets on the stuff I'm responsible for is production support. So going back to here, <clears throat> now that I know what should happen in all these scenarios, maybe I want to add it to my documentation so that in eight months when a question comes through about why did this happen to this student in this scenario, I know why it happened because I have the documentation from the matrix that I built when we developed the work eight months ago. Um, <clears throat> we also, we use our matrix matrices for writing automated regression tests. We know all the scenarios to be tested. So we know all the scenarios to be tested. We use it for manual testing and then we write our automated tests for it. Um, add it to our documentation. So that one matrix has many, many different uses. Um, I, I don't write unit tests, but I'm guessing that ma matrices of some sort could be helpful also with um, writing unit tests. Tool number two, where there's one, there's many. The source of this is my former boss. She used to say it time and time again, and eventually it sunk in. And then I grew to realize how, how many different ways you can kind of apply this tool. It's not a physical tool, it's a mindset, um, but I find it very helpful. Um, <clears throat> so where there's one, there's many. If, so if you find a defect, you can use that mindset to find more, and also sometimes to find the source of the defect, which can help the developer team then fix the defect. So <clears throat> when I find a defect, I ask, what other types of users might this happen to? You can ask what other data might trigger the error, what other browser might this happen in? Um, <clears throat> if a bug happens when there's a null value, let your mind just wander. Well, what if there's multiple null values? What if there's multiple non-null values? What if there's invalid values? If it's a value problem where there's one there are, met, there are many, what other value types could cause this, this error or any other error? Um, <clears throat> another question that we are learning to ask more and more is when a bug is caused by a common code change um, on, on work that seems for us on the kind of the testing BA team seems unrelated, but we understand in the common code, it clearly made a change under the hood. What else could that common code change have possibly impacted? <clears throat> and this also just happened to us. We made a change in our last release, and then we realized, we found out that it caused an error. It broke one of our service calls. And so, we kept pushing and digging to find out what else could that initial change have broken. And it, we found three other um, batches. I don't know if that's, that's we, we call them batches. Three batches that were also impacted that no one really realized. So where there's one, there's many. Keep asking the question, keep looking for patterns, keep looking for other scenarios. Um, <clears throat> when we did our conversion, we recently converted um, our student portal app to a mobile friendly student portal app. We're behind the times I know, but that's not for discussion today. Um, but there was a lot of browser specific and device specific errors. So for example, if we found a banner, a, um, a message at the top of the screen, if a banner broke, we had a lot of other questions. Where there's one, there's many. Is this all banners? Is this all devices? Is this all browsers? <clears throat> and kind of going down that path, it was really, really helpful for us to log one defect for all the places that was broken, and then it in turn help the developer find out the root cause and fix it smartly, efficiently, um, and beautifully. Uh, this is another example. 
uh, this man here on the screen is Andrew Carnegie. He was one of the founders, founded Carnegie Mellon University. Uh, we built this new screen to display whether a student was signed up for our alert system. And the test case just said, um, show a green check mark if they did sign up and show a red X if they had not signed up. But what we found when we started testing was that we hadn't written the test case and the developer hadn't written the code to display the answer when the student hadn't answered. So there was no data and the screen aired. So uh, we learned from it. So now we've added handling null data to our test case writing checklist. We then asked in the, in the line of where there's one, there's many. Okay, so this question, CMU alert, that erred on null data. What other fields on this screen could error with null data? And then we, we kind of added the matrix into the thought process and thought about are there items that could have null data? Are there items that could have multiple data values and so on. So that one defect, because we stopped and thought about it, led to more robust testing, <clears throat> an improved checklist to use in the future, um, and we were able to find it, have greater confidence in the code we were going to release to production. Um, and I, yeah, I guess that's it. It was just, it was a good, it was a good find. It was an edge case defect that was hard to find. And it just, it just resulted in a lot of good, um, uh, good outcomes. Tool number three, checklists. <clears throat> I just mentioned a checklist. Um, so at the California conference I went to, uh, Star West, this uh, Peter Varhol gave a talk on what air crews can teach testing teams. Um, the video is out on YouTube if you're interested. Um, but he, again, I'm a, I've always been a list maker. I'll add something to a list just to cross it off because I did it just to feel that satisfaction of having done a thing. Um, but a checklist uh, we sort of used and hearing how and why air crews use them reinforced how helpful they can be to our team. And so we've kind of upped the focus that we give to checklists in our development team and our testing team together. Um, so his talk, um, this is right from the, his presentation, using a checklist can basically um, help you remember all the things to remember because we can't remember it all of it all the time. It organizes complicated decision-making and it makes sure that critical tasks are not overlooked. Um, so I, that's, you can't argue with that. That just makes sense. So one example of a checklist that we wrote a long time was pretty basic, um, but we found that our testing focused a lot on the functional, the new functionality that we were just building and overlooked some of the what I'll call basics in our team, which is the right values in the data, the right content in the logs, the right authorization behavior. We got just kind of focused on the functionality and not on the basics. I don't know if that makes sense. Um, but anyway, so we wrote a checklist and it helped us remember the things that we need to remember the critical things because if you don't have good logs it's hard to triage production errors and all kinds of stuff another checklist example um, this is from when we did the conversion for our student portal to be mobile friendly i will not go through the whole list because it is long <laughs> but um it was it was a bit mind-numbing to test all of these different items uh, that you can see on the checklist on 35 different screens over six months of testing. That was a lot of testing. And without the checklist, I, I'm 100% sure that we would not have delivered such a solid and mostly bug-free product. Um, so yeah, it was a really good checklist. <clears throat> um, so I do 
recommend them. Okay, so we all have talked about, and I'm sure we all agree, how um, fun and helpful bugs are to find, different ways to think about finding them. But now that we found a bug, now what do we do? <clears throat> and fixed it, of course. Um, so we can add lessons learned to our acceptance test cases <clears throat> that we write to our punch lists, to checklists, and this can be developers, business analysts, testers, everybody. Um, you can also um, use keywords or labels in whatever defect tracking system you have to help see patterns and gather metrics. If, if, um, if you're seeing a lot of defects come through on, um, I'll pick on, on your log entries, <clears throat> release after release, you're getting defects on not enough or not the right information being written to your logs on your development work. That's, if you, if you can track that, then it's easier to identify and make improvements and adjustments to, to decrease the amount of defects found in the future. One of the best kind of bugs is one that helps prevent future bugs. So I think it's really important, as hard as it is with how busy so many of us are, it's very important to just take a moment, stop, slow down, and learn something from the work you just did. So <clears throat> I know I have a lot of developers in the room. So you're a developer, but you're talking about testing tools. Well, that's okay. Tools can be adapted. <clears throat> so um, you can use what you see in your own world to build your own checklist. Maybe it's just for you. Maybe it's one you share with other devs. Maybe it's one you can share with the whole team. If you see a defect come in, you can think of, consider thinking about, I don't want to tell you how to do your job. You can think about thinking about where there's one, there's many. You see the code, you see the data, you're in it up to your eyeballs. Where there's one, there's many. What else might have gotten broken? What else might we want to test? Um, even if it's, you know, we know it's not, we, I'm talking as a tester and a BA because that's a lot of what I do. I know it's not the developer's job to test, but I love it when they say, you know what, you might want to go look at this other thing and make sure it runs. That helps a lot because it shows interest. It shows um, commitment to the project, and it helps, I think, all of us on my team feel better about the code before it goes um, to release. Okay, so what if you're in user support, production support, whatever your um, organization calls it? These are testing tools, that's true, but again, they can be adapted. Um, you can think about where there's one, there's many. It helps you be proactive and not just, not just act on the one error that just came in through feedback, but take that, think about it, and ask questions to find other possible errors before even more feedback starts coming in. A testing matrix can be, become a triage matrix to help you pin down the issue and find the problem spots. Um, and a checklist, again, for support responsibilities, I think it's probably one of the best tools out there. So if you're not already using it, consider starting some. But I'm a, I'm a PM, I'm a RM, RTE, whatever you are. All the tools can be adapted, um, probably to grocery shopping for, <laughs> for that matter. Um, they're not tools just for testing, they're more of a mindset um, of a toolbox um, for you to consider using in your world. So I've shared all my stuff. What um, do people want to share back to me? Questions, comments? Feel free to unmute or you can type in the chat channel. Hi, Jen. I have a question. Sure. Um, so as a developer, I'm curious uh, how much testing you sort of expect a developer to have done of their feature um, before they send it to QA. That's a, that is a great question. Um, 
so I'll, I will, I mean, of course, I'm going to give my answer. I don't know if it's the right one, but it's mine. I ideally, um, so, and again, not knowing how all the different teams work. So our team right now, a year ago, went through a shift in the process. So we uh, write, we gather requirements, we write the test cases, which are pretty detailed. It go, the, then it goes through development. My expectation is that the developer has read all the test cases for sure. And yeah, I mean, and has run through them, honestly. So that, yeah, so that's my expectation from my chair with the little power that I have in my little world. I do expect the developer to have run through the test cases on the code they just wrote. So I often find we don't actually have written test cases. Um, so that makes that harder. that's challenging. <laughs> we don't do a lot of test driven development where we are. Um, but uh, yeah, so just from my perspective, I try to um, do more than just like test the, what you would call the happy path. Right. Um, I try to, I, I try to think about a couple of different scenarios, but to a certain extent, I'm, I'm, I'm depending on your great big brains to, um, <laughs> to get all the things I didn't think of. So, right. Yeah. Understood. And so it's interesting. So for the, for many years, we wrote the kind of the requirements, I guess, and that our developers wrote the code and wrote the test cases which made sense for a long, long time because you know what's supposed to happen. So you can write really good test cases, but then we eventually kind of found that you'll write the test cases for what you know would work, not you, you know, specifically, but, um, but it's better. Anyway, so we did shift for the BAs to write the test cases and it goes through a review process by the lead BA to try to flush out all those scenarios so that so that you don't have to think about them we think about them um but it it is it was definitely a shift for the team it definitely takes a lot more time um it, it is working well but but yeah it's a hard it's hard to write for all the scenarios when they're not given to you <laughs> i um i feel for you on that one um all right i'm gonna go to chat yeah yeah so <clears throat> what are my thoughts on the idea of shift left in lean development so <clears throat> ooh, i love these questions okay so so i will be i'm just gonna say i don't know how much time we have left noah how much time looks like 10 minutes 10 minutes can <laughs> i don't want to can I just say, I, I wonder if somebody else could tell, I don't know shift left, so I wonder if maybe- I'm not, I have a guess on shift left, but I'm also not well versed in that term. So if someone can speak up. Sure, um, that, that, that was my question. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Um, so so uh, shift left uh, comes from the, really from the Toyota production system when um, the Toyota manufacturing processes were introduced into, um, car companies in the US and at the time what they were finding is that you know the people on the production process they had sort of a very narrow view of what their job was and they would sort of do their work and it would go down the line and it would get into QA and QA would look at it and say oh it's broken and they'd have to like send the car back to the beginning of the assembly line you'd have right. to tear half of it apart there's all this rework involved and so the idea of shift left is that you're pushing the um, the understanding of quality into the production of the power or to stop what and see it defect so that it's solved early on rather than propagating through the process. So, so thank you. So that does match what I thought it meant, <laughs> which is a good thing. So I think. I think that's kind of what my team is going through. We are, we are trying to shift left. A lot of the times I think it's feeling like 
a shove left. Um, <laughs> I do think I might regret saying this someday, but I, I do feel like it's the right thing to do because it, all of the thinking we can put in the beginning ends up with less rework at the end, which is basically what you just kind of said. Um, so, so those are my thoughts on shift left. How does that affect my work and my role? It's a lot more, it's a lot more work. Um, <laughs> but again, it's really good work and I would eventually have to do it in the testing, you know, column on the Kanban board, for example, mm -hmm. I just have to do it on the eLab column instead. Um, and it, I think even though it's more, it feels like more work because we're still adjusting um, for rally or uh, JIRA or whatever. I think there's less overhead. I don't have to log five defects because I wrote my testing matrix when I wrote the test case. And it's, there's just, I, I do think it's eventually more efficient. It's just a lot of work to adapt the whole team um, and learn what your workflow is once you do that shift left. Yeah, from my point of view, um, just to respond to your your talk a little bit. Yeah. As a developer, the um, you know we tend to get sort of focused in the code that we're writing, and the mind tools that you presented, I think, are really useful. In particular, sort of um, that avoiding the happy path testing um, is is a huge problem, and so I think that there is a role like. You know, thinking about testing and thinking about the ways that people um, are, you know, have blind spots in their thought process and um, being sort of subject matter expert on that so that our teams can be more aware of how to think about testability and outcomes as they're writing the code. Mm -hmm. That's a real resource. And I, I think that the stuff that you put together addresses that very well. So, so I did want to thank you for that. That was really cool. Good. Yay. <laughs> this is my, anyway, I won't, this is my first talk on a tech topic ever. Uh, I went, I worked in financial aid for a lot of years and I could do that, but so this is fun, but a little nervous uh, feeling. So thanks. Um, so there's another question in chat. Would you say you then that testing is a mental discipline? Absolutely. <laughs> um, we've actually struggled to find, it, it's not a struggle to find good testers, but being a good tester, you just have to be so curious and so stubborn <laughs> and just want to dig and dig and dig. And that it's, it's not something you can easily teach a person. I think the best testers and even some of the best BAs that I've run into just have this innate curiosity and stubbornness, um, I think is kind of what it boils down to, and a passion to, to deliver the best product. Um, tenacity, that's the word, that's the fancy word that means, I think, curious and stubborn. Um, so yeah, I think it is a mental, a mental mindset for sure. Um, what other questions? Um, Okay, so no, do I have time for one more? I don't have, oh, there's my clock. It's running, yeah. running five minutes, I guess. Okay, I'll do one more. That's a good question. Um, <clears throat> the question is, do you ever feel like the relationship between QA and the dev and engineering team can be antagonistic? How do you deal with that? <sighs> so sure, I think it, it's interesting from, from my chair, I find a defect, I'm delighted most, most of the time, unless it's just uh, too easy and you're my face shouldn't, shouldn't be that easy to find defect. Um, but, I, but I do know and I try to remember that as a developer, it's not always a fun feeling to see defects added to the tile that you just thought you finished. Um, <clears throat> so I think, I think it's, important for a tester to acknowledge that. You doing your job well means pointing fingers at a developer who also probably did their job well. It's just a defect. And so 
Um, <clears throat> one thing uh, that I think comes from, I think, I don't know if I'm actually going to answer the question, but it's another tidbit that I'll, it's a, it's a tool that I'll share. <clears throat> Taking the word you out of language is very, very helpful, especially with all of our Slack and IM and email conversations. <clears throat> um, I, I never say in my defects, you didn't do the thing or your code. It, it's not accusatory, it just is. And so we try to be very objective in how we write our defects. Um, because I don't, 90, I'll say at least on my team, 96% of the time, I know the developer did their very best job, but there's still a defect. It's no one's fault. And, and it's just like when, so any, yeah. So I think for the developers, I would say we, we as testers under, can try to understand how you feel when a defect is logged on your tile when a defect is found in production, because that means I didn't do my job well. Except that's not what it means. I did my job as, as well as I could, but one got through. Developers did their job as well as they could, but one got through. So um, <clears throat> it didn't answer the question. <laughs> um, I think a lot of the, I think the way to mitigate that feeling of the antagonistic feeling is just the team. It's not a one-to-one -one interaction between the, the tester and the developer, it's the team feeling. So I think if the, if the team has a positive, collaborative process improvement attitude, um, I, I hope and I think that that just fosters an environment where there's not a lot of antagonism. Um, I don't know if anyone wants to add to that, chime in in our last two minutes. Um, yeah, so yeah, I'm seeing someone kind of, I think echoing what I just said, um, their initial reaction to getting a bug is kind of like a ug, which I get, because um, it feels like they did something wrong, but they try to remember the final product. And, and that is it. And, also remember we're human <laughs> and it's it's not always your fault it's because the test case didn't cover it it's because elab didn't ask the question there's a lot of different reasons why a bug is a bug um, but you know just like she said um, the the end product is our goal being the best we can be to have the least number of grumpy users as we can have um, can I ask one quick question? Of really, course. Just, I always like to see how teams are structured. And so in your organization, could you, is there like a ratio with QA engineers versus uh, yeah. developers? So I had a whole slide. I don't know if it's still here. Yeah, so we, I skipped this because I was going to run out of time. Um, our team has about 10 or 15 developers and about four or five testers and analysts. Um, those four or five testers and analysts also do production support requirements gathering um, all that stuff so that's a great right. slide I can't believe you skipped this one look at those I, I know. right it's fantastic <laughs> you're like hiding Hi. the gym okay. <laughs> um, yeah good question I just wanted to mention if I could um, that there is a feedback form I, I'm gonna post the link again um, for the nerd summit nerd summit and also mm -hmm. We just really, it helps us get better every year. Yeah. So back in the chat. And there's also a Slack channel for this room, room 321, I think. Yeah. Um, so feel free to tag me with questions over there too, because we're going to lose this chat um, after today. Um, I'm going to ask, I'll take another question. So I switched, I uh, worked in financial aid. Uh, for students for 10 years and I switched to QA because my financially job was boring and I knew the right person who asked me to volunteer on this testing project and it just led me down this hard earned path um, to a QA job and I love it. 
Um, yes. Oh, and feedback is a gift. It really is. Just like a defect is a gift. <laughs> Maybe I'll end right there. <laughs> Thank you so much, Jen. Thanks, everybody.